This online lecture, we are in our third installment of the early medieval period, and we are looking at the Atonian period. So the Atonian period is different from the Carolingian period because it marks a change in um, rulership, where you have the autos, autos one, two, and three. And I also do feel compelled to mention that there were two queens that ruled over uh, the Etonian Empire as regents, uh, Queens Adelaide and Theophanu. So Charlemagne's empire, um, as you can see, it only lasted 43 years. Um, and the problem was, after he died, he decided it would be a good idea to uh, divide power amongst his three grandsons. Now this is a really interesting choice because we know from our Carolingian lecture that Charlemagne was all about reviving the Roman Empire. And apparently he missed the part of Rome's history when they tried this. And uh, they had the Tetrarchy, there was a sculpture in your textbook uh, from that time where they divided power up into four ways and it failed spectacularly. Um, somehow Charlemagne didn't catch on to that and replicated that power sharing uh, model and it resulted in the end of the Carolingian uh, dynasty. So his empire was divided am up amongst his three grandsons. They fought amongst themselves. The empire uh, eventually split up. Also intensified Viking invasions also contributed to the downfall of the Carolingians. Now the other thing that's different with the um, Etonian Empire is that we also are seeing um, a reduction in territory. We don't have an empire that is the same size as um, Charlemagne's empire that we see in the map here on the screen. So it was in the mid 10th century, particularly the year 936, that the eastern part of the former empire of Charlemagne was consolidated under the rule of Otto I. Now the thing that's good news for us is that it's fairly straightforward uh, in terms of art because you have just simply a continuation of Carolingian tradition which is perpetuating um, the uh, link between imperial power and Christianity that was um, part of the early Roman Empire, early Christian Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. We do, though, see some new elements being incorporated in as well, which was something that happened in the Carolingian period also. Let's take a look. So we're going to start out by looking at this interior of a church. Um, the Etonian architects did follow the course of their Carolingian predecessors, where they would take basilica structures and they would um, sort of improve or add to them. Now the addition that is seen in the Etonian period is the gallery. Now this is kind of confusing because it's actually not the first time we see the gallery in architecture, but it's really when we start to see the gallery being regularly incorporated into the nave elevation. Now when I say nave elevation, and don't worry about this term because I'm going to teach it to you later, I'm referring to the walls here on the side of the nave. Now we know that up until this point, typically, typically the nave elevation include the clerestory, the row of windows up here, and then our collocade, our combo arcade and uh, colonnade. The new addition we see is here, the gallery. Now in terms of the function of the gallery, really the function is whatever. Uh, it was really up to the church and the needs of the church to determine how this space was utilized. Um, Sometimes we do see that the gallery would be like kind of a space for sequestering nuns so that they would be sitting from separate from the rest of the congregation in the nave. However, this was a nun's church, so that function seems unlikely in this instance. The gallery could be used to um, perhaps like house the choir, maybe uh, to display relics. It really, again, is up to um, the discretion of the, the church. Another thing to just kind of take notice of is do take a look at the, um, the, the collocade. This is a unique collocade in that it's not columns, but actually there's an alternating um, pier that's put in. Column, pier, a pier is just like a square column, and those alternate. What some art historians say is that this alternation of the uh, column with the pier actually affects the visual rhythm. 
So the visual rhythm, which is the repeating of similar visual elements, uh, tracks the eye. And so the, the eye would jump from similar element to similar element. And that uh, typically, if this were all columns, would help to lead the eye to the focal point of the interior, which is the apse that contains the altar. By putting our peer in, what that does is actually breaks up the visual rhythm. It gives the design a kind of vertical emphasis that sort of leads the eye up here, which um, some of the art, art historians say that exists as a way to kind of um, encourage the viewer to take note of the uh, new architectural element that's been incorporated in. Now the other thing that I want to point out, just because I want you to have this on your radar for future lectures, is take a look at the ceiling. You'll notice that the ceiling is flat and that the ceiling is made of wood. That's all you need to do is note that. When we get into the Romanesque and the Gothic periods, we're looking at churches that are going to be increasing uh, quite significantly in their size. We're going to start to see modifications made to this uh, flat wooden ceiling in order to accommodate the increasing size and height of these structures. So here we have some pretty amazing bronze doors. I do not have the scale um, on the slide here, but they are 16 feet, so they are tall. Uh, these were commissioned by Bishop Vernvard, who is one of the great, if not the greatest, patron of Ottonian art and architecture, and he was commissioning art under the reign of Otto III. So St. Michael's Church was built, and these were the doors that the bishop commissioned. They led into the church. Now what happened was the bishop was visiting Rome, and on his travels he stopped by the Santa Sabina. And this is an early Christian church that was renowned for its carved wooden doors that had all kinds of uh, figurative sculptural embellishment that looked very similar to what we're seeing here. Although these are bronze, the Santa Sabina's doors were wooden. And these doors were the inspiration to the doors that we see here. So yet again, we're seeing the sort of, um, the uh, looking back to uh, early Christian artistic forms by replicating these doors. Now these doors contain scenes from both the Old and New Testaments. And the um, images that you see here, these are from the Old Testament and these are from the New Testament. Now I'm going to go ahead and just um, list what we're seeing. You don't necessarily have to take notes if you don't want to. I'm not going to include this on any exam, but just for your information. These here too are scenes from um, the Garden of Eden. Um, this is the formation of Eve. Eve is being presented to Adam. These two here are the fall, the temptation of um, and the fall of Adam and Eve. This is when they're um, being accused by uh, God right in here. They get kicked out. This is the expulsion here. And now they have to work. Here's Adam and Eve laboring. And then Eve's children. And there's a reason why I'm saying Eve and not Adam and Eve. Eve's children. These are um, offerings by um, where'd my thing? offerings by Cain and Abel. And then right here, this is when Cain murders Abel. Now on this side, the doors, we have um, the New Testament scenes, and actually they're read uh, from bottom up. So down here we have the Annunciation, where um, Mary is told surprise or pregnant. Here uh, in this next scene, this is the Nativity scene where Jesus is born, the Adoration of the Magi, and the presentation of Jesus in the temple. So these have to do with the infancy of Jesus. Now it's like a huge jump ahead, and we get to the Passion, which involves the crucifixion of Jesus. Here is the judgment by Pontius Pilate, and then here is the crucifixion. Then we have the promise of return to paradise, and the two up here, three Marys at the tomb, and then uh, the don't touch me uh, scene up in here. So what's interesting about this, and there's a reason why I'm pointing this out, First of all, you can see that there's extensive narrative um, that's incorporated into these doors, but the placement is really thought out and is actually very strategic, where the placement of the Old Testament next to the New Testament, they either prefigure, the Old Testament prefigures the New Testament, or there is a kind of conceptual correlation. So like, let me give you an example. This is brilliant, the way that this is set up. These are really, really sophisticated and well thought out um, 
placement of a uh, narrative. Like, for example, here, this is when they're um, indulging in the forbidden fruit. And the idea is, is that, um, you know, the, the, the forbidden fruit, the, the kicking out of the Garden of Eden, that these things are what instill original sin within people. Now, Jesus, when he's crucified, is a way to kind of rectify um, this original sin so people eventually can go into heaven. So you can see there's a conceptual link there. Here we have Eve's children across Mary, right? Another important female, biblical female, and Mary uh, having a, a child as well. So they do uh, relate and correlate together. The other thing that Bernvard commissioned is he commissioned this really tall column. Column with reliefs illustrating the life of Christ. This is uh, 12 and a half feet tall. It's also made of bronze. And um, this is pretty significant for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, the, these do, the scenes on here, there's 24 of them. And they begin with the baptism of Jesus and then conclude with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And these are uh, conveyed in a spiral narrative frieze that extends up the column. Hmm, this sure seems familiar to me. I feel like we've seen in this class a tall column with a spiral narrative freeze. Can you recall where we've seen this before? If you said Trajan's column in ancient Rome, you would be correct. This is an example of another artwork that is um, sort of inspired by uh, column, the column of Trajan. There also, by the way, was a column of Marcus Aurelius that looked similar to this as well. Now, this is important because this actually kind of fills in the narrative gap of the doors. If I could go back for a minute, remember how we kind of have like a huge jump here, right? Where we go from Jesus as a baby to Jesus being persecuted. Well, what about all the things that happened in between? These 24 scenes address that gap. Um, and so then we have this kind of narrative continuity, which to me what's really happening, and I think again that this is brilliant, I'm a huge fan of Bishop Bernvard and what he's commissioning, it links the exterior with the interior. That as you're going in from the exterior, you see all of this narrative that contextualizes a lot of the, the biblical um, information that's pre presented in the, in the Mass. And then at the inside, immediately as you enter in, it kind of fills in um, the rest of the religious story. And then finally, we have Otto the Third enthroned from the Gospel Book of Otto the Third. So, what we see here is we see um, a pretty significant painting, in that it yet once again is indicating this desire seen in both the Carolingian and the Etonian periods of harking back to early Christian Rome or the Byzantine Empire. Now take a look at the composition in this image. This should seem familiar to you, something that we've seen before. Take a minute, pause the video, and try to see if you can figure out what artwork this is emulating. And again, your hint is that this is either from early Christian Rome or the Byzantine Empire. So pause the video, figure it out, and then come back. So hopefully you would be able to figure out that we have um, a work of art that is replicating Justinian and his attendants from San Vitale. Remember this? I think I have it in here. Here it is, yes. You have the emperor centrally placed, wearing the regal color of purple, the crown, in both cases bedazzled. I find it interesting that Otto III doesn't have a halo. I'm not sure why, but he doesn't. Uh, but otherwise, we've got that central placement. We have on um, either side in our Justinian mosaic, the uh, military and the clergy and the administration, the Byzantine government as it's known in its entirety. Over here, it's a little different of a situation. You have the clergy, of course. And then over here, you have uh, the wealthy landowners who also played a role in uh, the government. So we have that reference. Now, there's another reference that's being made as well. And this one might not be immediately familiar to you because we didn't look at this work of art in its entirety when we were studying early Christian Rome. 
And that influence is coming from the Colossus of Constantine. When we looked at the Colossus of Constantine in class, I showed you sculptural fragments. Remember, we saw the eight foot tall head, we saw the bicep, the kneecap. You can actually see these are like the pieces that, that are still here. We saw the shin um, as well. Here we're seeing the Colossus of Constantine in its entirety, which altogether was approximately 40 feet tall. Now we know that, the, that Constantine in this image is replicating a very well-known cult statue of Zeus from ancient Greece. And we can see that Otto III has, um, he has replicated that. And so he too sits with the, uh, the scepter, indicating power. He too holds the orb, which um, is a representation of world domination. And you can interpret that as Christian world domination, or you can interpret it as Otto III domination as well. Either way, they're both bold claims to power. Now, I want to remind you that this is something that's typical to see these references of Constantine, because don't forget, Constantine is one of the superstars of the Middle Ages, the other superstar being Charlemagne. Although it's still a little bit early, we don't start to see Charlemagne really being celebrated or referred to in art until we get to um, the Middle, uh, Middle Ages, which is the Romanesque period, and that is the next period that we will be studying in this class.